On April 26, 1986, one of the worst nuclear disasters in the history of the world took place at the Chernobyl nuclear power plant. That day, engineers in charge were conducting a standard safety test on reactor number 4. Such tests were standard procedure in the plant and were undertaken many times before. This time, however, partially due to a fault in reactor design, but primarily due to a breach in safety protocols, the test ended with the explosion of the reactor. The fire that broke out was contained after nine days. During this period, tons of radioactive dust was released into the air. The amount of radiation emitted was 400 times more than the atomic bomb dropped on Hiroshima. The radioactive clouds spread from Chernobyl and the Soviet Union across the European continent, reaching its westernmost edges. Behind the scenes of the disaster, while hundreds of thousands of liquidators fought to clean up the mess caused by the explosion, Soviet authorities fought a battle of their own. The government in Moscow decided to keep the accident under the radar. Neither citizens of the Soviet Union nor the world were supposed to discover the true scale of the Chernobyl disaster. The truth, if revealed, would have exposed the incompetence of authorities that led to disaster. Although the Soviet government had set the country on a new course with the policy of perestroika, or reconstruction, in 1986, the Soviet Union was still a totalitarian country. Every single field of political, economic, or social life was under the control of the Communist Party. Nothing happened without the permission of the party. Decision-making, even at the lowest levels, was subject to control from the Central Committee. The Chernobyl power plant was no different. The explosion of reactor number 4 happened less than a minute after the start of the test at 1.23 a.m. Viktor Bryokhanov, the plant director, was immediately informed of the explosion. He passed the information to local authorities, who by 2.15 a.m. had cordoned off the plant and the nearby town of Pripyat, forbidding anyone from entering or leaving the area. It was a decades-old practice of the communist regime in the Soviet Union. By controlling information flow about a particular situation, they controlled the situation. At 3 a.m., the information about the situation reached the Communist Party commissar in charge of nuclear matters. Two hours later, the telephone rang for the general secretary of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, Mikhail Gorbachev. All the officials within the chain of responsibility, from the test supervisor to the most powerful man in the country, reported that only a minor incident occurred at Chernobyl and that the situation was under control. Gorbachev agreed that the situation should be kept secret and sent a commission with Deputy Prime Minister Boris Shervina in charge of running the operations in Chernobyl. The blown-off roof of reactor number 4 was evidence enough that something more severe than a minor incident happened. Furthermore, the situation was anything but under control. The thing was, no one dared to announce the reactor was dead and that the catastrophe well underway. Such a decision could only be made by the highest authorities. It is still a mystery whether later testimony of the officials involved of being unaware of the magnitude of the accident are true or not. In any case, a decision was made not to disturb the members of Politburo, the executive body of the Communist Party. Citizens of the nearby town of Pripyat, of whom the majority were employees of the power plant, were spared any information regarding the accident as well. Instead, they were allowed to spend the upcoming weekend relatively carefree. Saturday, April 26, 1986, was just another weekend day in Pripyat. The weather was nice, and the town swarmed with people of all ages. Children were playing in parks. Restaurants and cafeterias were filled with people. Entire families were out to enjoy the mild spring sun. However, none of them was aware that there was something else in the air besides the cheerful atmosphere. The authorities kept citizens of Pripyat in the dark and denied them information that the radioactive cloud was already over their heads. By midday, the radiation level rose from 0.15 to 1.2 rentgen per hour. Some of the experts within the government commission found the situation a matter of grave concern. Still, Sherbina, the guy in charge, was reluctant to call for the town's evacuation. He stated that such a thing would be in contrast with the letter of the law that said that the evacuation was necessary only if the radiation dose accumulated by individuals reached the 75 rentgen mark. His calculations that the radiation intake in Pripyat would not exceed 4.5 rentgen per day were far below the statutory limit. Therefore, there was no way Shabina would do such a thing as breaking the policy as a precaution, not unless he wanted to be accused of spreading unnecessary panic. Moreover, Shabina was instructed not to give the slightest clue to citizens of Pripyat that their lives were in danger. As the day went on, the citizens of Pripyat began to realize something was going on. Military aircraft filled the sky and soldiers wearing gas masks appeared at the railway station. In the afternoon, radiation was so high that a metallic smell spread through the air rumors began to circulate. The authorities, however, stuck to their story. When asked about the smoke coming from the plant, they simply replied it was a steam discharge. By the end of the day, 
The level of radiation in the town went sky high, and Sherbina finally agreed the time had come to save the lives of citizens. It was a matter of hours anyway before the citizens would realize what was going on. At 1 a.m. on April 27th, Sherbina ordered the evacuation of Pripyat, but not before he got permission from Moscow. Early in the morning, the Pripyat radio station made an official announcement that unfavorable radiation conditions were developing in the city of Pripyat and that the residents had to evacuate temporarily to nearby settlements of the Kiev province. Hundreds of buses were brought from Kiev for the evacuation. Being the good citizens they were, residents of Pripyat obeyed the authorities and evacuated the town in perfect order. They were allowed to bring only necessary items. By the end of the day, there was not a living soul in Pripyat. Despite the evacuation, the authorities still made no official announcement about the scale of the accident in the power plant. However, the first short announcement was aired on Monday, April 28th. An accident has taken place at the Chernobyl power station, and one of the reactors was damaged. Measures are being taken to eliminate the consequences of the accident. Those affected by it are being given assistance. A government commission has been set up. The announcement was not only brief, but also wholly inaccurate. It was just a minor mishap, the officials repeated. The drinking water from the reservoir near Pripyat was declared safe. The irradiated buses that were used for the evacuation were returning to their regular routes in Kiev. There is no mention of the radioactive cloud hovering over the area. The message from the authorities was everything was in perfect order. The truth, they thought, would cause unwanted panic and undermine their own positions and the authority of the party. The approach of the national holiday, Labor Day, on May 1st, was yet another reason to avoid negative publicity and possible chaotic scenes. Indeed, on May 1st, a grand outdoor parade was held in Kiev. Thousands of people paraded in the streets, completely unaware of dangerous radiation spreading from a plant less than 70 miles away. The Soviet government was determined not to reveal a disaster was going on. Not only the entire nation was kept in the dark, but also the entire world, especially the world. If the world found out that a reactor exploded in one of the Soviet Union's nuclear power plants, it would severely impact its international reputation. With control of all sources of information in their hands, it was easy for the government to pursue the cover-up agenda at the national level. However, keeping the disaster secret abroad turned out to be an impossible mission once the radiation began to spread outside the borders of the Soviet Union and the reach of communist authorities. The first non-Soviet location to detect excessive radioactivity in the atmosphere was the Forsmark nuclear power plant in Sweden, 700 miles from Chernobyl. On April 2nd, they detected higher levels of radioactivity than normal. It didn't take long before they realized that this was a result of a major nuclear catastrophe. Measurements traced the source of radioactivity to Ukraine, at the time a federal unit of the Soviet Union. As the radioactive cloud continued to spread across the continent, the Soviet secret began to be revealed. In Bonn, one of the scientists from the Soviet embassy asked his German counterparts for advice on extinguishing a graphite fire in a nuclear reactor core. Little by little, fragments of reports on the nuclear disaster were reaching the public worldwide. A few days after the Swedish discovery, the entire world overwhelmed the Soviets with questions about what was going on. The radioactive particles were settling on people and crops, endangering the lives and health of millions. The Soviet government remained dead silent, not saying a single word about the accident. Moreover, foreign reports about the disaster were denounced as capitalist propaganda against the Soviet state. The Soviet reluctance to cooperate on this matter only infuriated the Europeans, especially those closest to the Soviet Union. Neighboring countries immediately imposed embargoes on the import of goods from Ukraine. The worldwide community called for international control over the entire Soviet peacetime nuclear program. With each day, the pressure grew on the Soviet government to speak. In the end, the burden of responsibility became too big for both Gorbachev and the party. Finally, a week after the explosion, Soviet officials admitted that an accident had occurred, but maintained it was a minor one. When the firemen finally extinguished the fire in reactor number four on May 6th, Gorbachev decided to come clean with the whole truth. On May 14, he revealed what happened at Chernobyl in a short speech on the Soviet national television. The accident at the Chernobyl nuclear plant has painfully affected the Soviet people and shocked the international community. For the first time, we confront the real force of nuclear energy out of control. The world was angered by Soviet reports of the disaster that put the entire continent in danger but not as much as with the fact that the government in Moscow tried to hide it from the world. The initial enthusiasm with Gorbachev's reformist policy disappeared. The world realized that the Soviet Union had changed little since the period of the Iron Curtain. Gorbachev's speech caused chaos in Kiev, whose citizens fled the city in panic. 
The entire Soviet public was disappointed with how the authorities handled the situation. The fact that the government put the lives of citizens in danger to cover up their responsibility for the disaster was defeating. The political climate in the Soviet Union was such that the affair caused no immediate consequences for the government in Moscow. However, perhaps more than anything else, the Chernobyl disaster and the government's cover-up agenda led to the collapse of the entire system and the end of the Soviet Union five years later. For more videos on the most amazing forgotten parts of our history, be sure to subscribe to the Intrigued Mind channel, like the video, and leave your suggestions in the comments below.